All right, it's keynote time. But before that, we're going to have a quick little spiel from uh, Ob Fernandez from Hash Rocket, one of our awesome sponsors that we're really glad to have involved with us. So um, give him your time and attention, and then right after that, we'll have Chris Wanstreth up to give us a sweet keynote. I'm sure it will be brain-melting and also awesomely entertaining in other large words. <laughs> All right. Can everyone hear me? Okay. So um, I gave this talk at Ruby Fringe, and it was a big hit. And various people here said, hey, you know, if you can do it quick enough, uh, maybe you should just give it here. Uh, and I thought you guys would think it was cool. And I, I did figure out a way to turn this talk into a very short talk. Uh, basically, it's about sales and client management. And I think it's pretty straightforward. There's four steps. One is do great work for at least a few years, like I did at ThoughtWorks, write a best-selling book, start a consultancy, and profit. So, you, any questions? Uh, seriously, I'm going to go through it real quickly, but uh, I named the talk uh, Hustle. I feel like I've always uh, done some measure of hustling uh, in my life. Not in the negative connotation of hustle, but in the connotation of jumping on opportunities. Uh, when they came um, around, you know, not not as a con. I'm not talking about cons. I'm basically talking about obtaining what you want by uh, forceful action or persuasion. And I think that basically uh, forceful is is an adjective uh, that you need to you know consider when you think about how much competition there is in this space. Hashrock is a consultancy that's competing with you know literally hundreds of other consultancies for the same client base. So yes, forcefully. The reason I feel like I have the uh, experience to actually talk about this is that a lot of people might not realize I did a lot of sales at ThoughtWorks in my last two years there. Basically, once the Rails business started taking off, uh, they started pulling me in more and more to sell Rails business and until we turned it into like 50% of the revenues last year. So for a, a company that has 1,000 people worldwide, just think about that. It's a lot of Rails work that was going on. Um, so anyway, this talk about is about the sales cycle. I'm going to talk about marketing. Uh, so first step in marketing, looking good is a must. And yes, I do use a professional photographer from time to time. I've gotten ribbed for that, but yeah, that's me. And your face online is not necessarily as pretty as mine, so it's going to be your website or your blog. <laughs> Get a good designer is what I'm trying to say. The, it's one I really like from that phase. Uh, throw up a sex symbol if you, you, know, if you need to. Pretty girl always uh, takes you far. Terralian. Good-looking website, sir. Um, use your brand identity if you can to stand in the crowd. You know, you'll see Hash Rocketers <laughs> throwing the gang sign here. Uh, but you know, this this. <laughs> um, important lesson to learn here: pay well if you need to. So, basically, we had the idea for Hash Rocket late last year, and this was our first effort at the logo. That's a significantly uh, worse than what we have now. Basically, we paid Engine Works, uh, which is a design firm that we work with in Jacksonville, fifteen thousand dollars for doing brand identity and stuff, and that was actually a deal because they're friends of ours. You can expect to pay anywhere from twenty to twenty-five k to get this done successfully. Uh, practical concerns: uh, make sure your new leads can reach you easily. So, one important consideration is your phone number. Uh, people still use the, the phone. To contact you. I, I pick up the phone with a new lead probably three to four times a week. And we didn't have a phone number on our website at first for at least two or three months. And those were probably leads that were just, you know, going uh, unheard. Someone actually sent me an email and said, hey, you got to get a phone number out there. Um, encourage word of mouth. And I want to recommend this book called Never Eat Alone. And Keith Ferrazzi, Never Eat Alone. Just note it down. Get that book. It's a really, really good book that has, I think, uh, has helped me succeed a lot. So once you move out of marketing into qualifying, uh, one of the best things you can do is to narrow down your offerings by defining products. In our case, we have 3 to one Launch and Rescue Mission, uh, which I guess satisfies the spiel as a sponsor of this conference. But basically, 3 to one Launch is a four-week, $40,000 process where we get a startup's idea off the ground to a 1.0 uh, polished releasable to the public uh, product. Rescue mission is if your project's in deep doo-doo and you know, you're know you tearing your hair out, 
or you just fired a contractor who ripped you off to the tune of $50,000 and now you're out of grant money and you're going to lose your job and you're about to kill yourself. We do those sorts of things. Uh, my guys probably don't like the fact that we do these sorts of things, but uh, we do do them from time to time. Uh, still talking about qualifying. Give yourself constraints. So I'll give you real quickly here the Hash Rocket client profile. You must be working with a design firm or we won't work with you. You must have at least $50,000 or we won't work with you. You must be willing to travel to us, not vice versa. I don't want to repeat the same mistakes of uh, ThoughtWorks. Uh, you must not need more than four Rocketeers at a time. Basically, at the size that we're at, if we devote more than uh, four people to a project, it's too risky. And anyway, four people is about the max that I see as, uh, as far as productivity until you get diminishing returns. Uh, prefer startups or small divisions of larger firms. Uh, prefer to interface with individuals who themselves have a track record of being the best. The, um, the whole point of this is not for you to use this criteria, but the lesson here is for you to define this criteria for yourself or your firm. If you're an independent contractor or running a consultancy, you want to have a list like this actually written out. Uh, another great constraint is a minimal, uh, minimum billable rate. So if you say to yourself and you write down, you commit with everyone that you work with that you're only going to accept a minimum rate, you know, say $100 an hour, $125 an hour, and you never deviate from that, that's going to reduce the number of clients that you work with to the people that can afford to pay. Another important lesson, still in practical advice about qualifying, keep good track of your leads. It, you know, the, the effort that you put into marketing and talking to people and word of mouth goes to waste if you don't follow up on the leads that you actually get. So we use high rise and we religiously forward things to, ha uh, you know, to our Dropbox and high rise and have all our leads, you know, kind of categorize as cases and follow up on them religiously. In fact, I'm not even the person that follows up on leads. I have been who among other things is the person that qualifies having a separate person qualify is very important. If it's not the ultimate decision maker, since it's not me that has to make decisions about budget and I'm worried about cash flow and things like that, I can't be as objective with qualifying leads as Ben can, who just sees all of them uh, day to day. And then once those leads are qualified, you got to ask yourself, will this be a successful project? Defining success relates directly to your core values, and you should have core values written down. Uh, there's a good link there. I'll, I'll share it uh, via Twitter or something, but Andy Rutledge uh, wrote a lot about defining success. Some of the examples of success criteria he gives is basically, is the client prepared to begin? A lot of times they'll come to you with an idea that they're not necessarily ready to implement. At that point, you may not be ready to help them. They may, may not be ready for, them, uh, for you to help them. Are they prepared to engage? So maybe they are to the next step where they actually have requirements and things like that, but their stakeholders don't actually have the time to invest in it. Uh, does the client trust my team and its ideas? That one's kind of self-explanatory. Uh, will we be able to do our best work? How do you determine that? Well, it's, you know, it depends on you or, or your team, but basically, you know, how busy are they? How ready are they to take on a new project? How, how much do they understand the requirements? And determining success criteria involves getting to know your customers before you even necessarily engage with them. So we're big believers in using Skype. We use Skype to video conference or phone conference every client that we take on. That face-to-face -face contact, you know, even if it's over a video channel, is really, really important. Your own success criteria should stay constant. In other words, write them down. It's okay to refine them over time, but if you just kind of loosely define these and apply them in your mind every time you get a new lead, you're not going to do a good job of sticking to those. You're going to let your success criteria be affected by the current weather of how much do you need that business. Finally, uh, well, next step is closing. So you've qual uh, we did the marketing, qualifying, closing. The number one rule of closing is anyone? Always, Always be closing. Close all the fucking time. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so here's a tip, uh, very good practical tip uh, to help you with closing. Use master service agreements. Raise your hand if you know what a master services agreement is. Okay, at least some of you do. Basically, this is an agreement that says HashRocket agrees to perform services for, for the client as described in one or more statements of work. This particular document, the master services agreement, does not specifically commit your client to paying, nor does it commit you to doing any specific work. The work is defined in statements of work, which are added as appendices. The fact that you get them to sign this 
means that they're your client. But there's little barriers to getting them to sign it because basically there's, there's no firm commitment there yet. However, the psychology of them being your client actually facilitates the negotiation of work later on. There's other important things to go through, and this presentation is going to be available um, in, in its full version on InfoQ sometime soon. So I'll just flip through these real quick, uh, or you can talk to me about it uh, later. Um, but basically things like non-exclusivity, warranty of services and software, uh, the way that you're going to invoice them, and importantly, intellectual property. So some, some people like to, some people will willingly uh, do works for hire. Other people specifically do not do works for hire. For instance, the OG guys, uh, you know, specifically as a principal do not do works for hire. Problem is that a lot of clients will not work that way. They want the copyright, they want it to be a work for hire. They want everything that you do to belong to them. Well, if Tim, for instance, from Hashrock is working on the project and does on billable time a uh, Vim plugin, I don't want that to be owned by the client. You have to establish a boundary. You know, if we write a patch for Rails, we don't that want that to be owned by the client. Uh, there's cases where things that we do in open source, the license would prevent us from assigning ownership to the client. So a way to get around that, which I won't go into any more detail other than to say you define type A deliverables, which are all the domain-specific things like uh, models, controllers, and such that are specific to your client's business. You put a definition of what your client's business is in the contract, and then you say type B deliverables are things like technical frameworks, tools, methodologies, know-how, object code, source code, data models. You're basically covering your ass so that anything that's generic that you want to reuse that doesn't have anything to do specifically with your client's business, you can own. Publicity and reference is another thing you can put in master services agreement. Make sure that you know you can blog about things. Statement of work document basically as a summary, high-level feature descriptions, prerequisites. I'll, I'll go through this quickly. Uh, some sort of common sense things that a lot of you don't take the time to actually invest in, learn how to negotiate. It's not something that you naturally know how to do. It's something that a lot of the business people that you'll be working with have studied, uh, you know, either in school or over time. So don't put yourself at a disadvantage by not knowing how to negotiate effectively. And finally, the slide that caused the most uh, sort of discussion uh, at Ruby Fringe was that I say you should be billing on average at least $150 per hour. I say that to the guys here, like, uh, you know, that are working directly with the end client, that are the cream of the crop, you know, that you re if you really know what you're doing, if you've been working with Rails for, you know, a couple of years, you deliver, you know, consistently, you're good at what you do, you should be charging for that. Now, I want to clarify here, if you're, if you're working in a subcontractor kind of role, this is not going to apply. The economics are, of it are, are such that it's just not going to work because there's risk that the person that's subcontracting you actually takes on, and they're going to be the ones billing at $150 an hour. Uh, the importance of rates and how they're perceived and perceived value, you can read a lot about that, and, you can, and this book is actually really good for just your day-to-day -day life. Predictably Rational, The Hidden Forces That Shape Our Decisions by Dan Ariely is a must-read for everyone in this room. Absolutely just shows you a lot of things about human nature that will give you a lot of power and insight in your life. Uh, finally, client management. I'm just going to give you a very common sense advice here. Do remarkable work. The best solution for effective client management is to always focus on doing remarkable work. If you do crappy work, you're going to have client management problems. Uh, doing remarkable work is a, is a concept that, of, of course, you know, DHH talks about it. All sorts of people talk about it. Seth Godin kind of popularized the idea of being remarkable in his book, The Purple Cow. Um, getting past that, you, you guys know who these guys are, right? Um, you know... But the lesson here is not to fear your clients. Basically, make them fear you. You want to be... <laughs> um, I don't ha actually have my notes here. I purposely took out my notes so that I would go through these slides quickly. But, yeah, basically, hopefully you can take some of this knowledge, this stuff that I've learned over the years just, you know, in doing business and apply them to your own business that you do for clients, and it helps you out. Thanks.
By the way, party with Hash Rocket tonight in our RV starting about 9 o'clock. There'll be free booze and... Um, on or in? In. <laughs> there may be dancing on top uh, towards the end of the party, if you know what I mean. <laughs> 8 o'clock? All right. Uh, in the Marriott parking lot? Yeah, if you get the right phone number, we may come around and pick you up. So. If the police stop us, we're just going to move from the parking lot. Will the party come to us? The party may come to you. Yes. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you.